All right, so how do we do this in the laboratory? You may be asking yourself, how are you going to do this in the laboratory tomorrow? Well, it turns out uh, in a constant pressure calorimetry experiment, so calorimetry is uh, sort of the, um, again, the experiments where you're measuring energy transfer. Okay, so we talked about that. And the uh, device that you use to do calorimetry experiments are often called calorimeters. Okay, so this is a calorimeter. Okay, it doesn't look uh, too fancy. Okay, uh, usually we just use uh, styrofoam cups. So this is often called coffee cup calorimetry, especially in general chemistry. Um, you can use, if you really want to, you can use fancy thermoses to do this. But all you really want to do is eventually, what you're essentially you're doing is you're going to do a reaction inside this container, in this calorimeter. Okay? And you're going to measure the heat transfer. Well, you want, well, let's draw a picture. Okay. Okay, so here you got your coffee cup. Okay, I'll draw a coffee cup. All right, and you're going to have some reaction. Okay, so you have to do some reaction. Okay, tomorrow in the laboratory, you're going to be doing some acid base reactions. Okay, that'll be your reaction. Um, <clears throat> now, if that is, let's say it's an exothermic reaction, what's that mean again? gives off, transfers energy to the surroundings, okay? So that reaction is going to transfer energy to the surroundings, and its surroundings is the solution. The solution, S-O-L-N, that's usually how I abbreviate solution. Okay, so that's gonna transfer heat to the solution. And so, the reaction is my system And the solution is my surroundings. And it's transferring heat there. If this was an endothermic reaction, the solution would have transferred energy to the reaction. Okay. All right. But again, let's assume this is an um, exothermic reaction. And we're going to put a thermometer in there. What's going to happen to the temperature of the solution? It will increase. The temperature will go up, right? If it absorbs heat. Okay? And that's what we're going to measure that transfer of energy in the solution. So what we want to do is we want to minimize the heat transfer to anything else that is the surroundings. Okay? So of course the air above the solution, that could absorb some of the heat. So probably we're going to keep the volume as high to the lid as possible and don't want to minimize the amount of air in there. And also, it's going to transfer energy to the container itself. And of course, we want to minimize that by using a really good insulator. And you know what's a really good insulator that meets uh, Broward College's budget requirements? <laughs> Styrofoam cups! <laughs> and yes, we're going to reuse them for multiple apps, so don't throw them away in one year. Okay? <laughs> We reduce, reuse, recycle. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's why styrofoam uh, cups are used. Because they're a really good insulator. And so as much of the heat as possible is being transferred to the solution, and that's what we're monitoring. We're monitoring the temperature of that solution. Okay. So here's how we're going to get to delta H, our heat of the reaction. So the first thing we're doing is we're measuring the temperature change of the surroundings because we want to figure out how much heat is being absorbed by the surroundings, a.k.a. the solution. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to calculate heat of the solution, which is going to be mc delta T. <coughs> Eventually, we want to calculate delta H. So this will be our third and final step. Delta H, heat of the reaction, which is equal to heat of the reaction divided by the moles.
but we're in the lab, we're measuring the heat transferred to the solution. How is the solution and the heat of the reaction, how are they related? What's their relationship? What do we think? Opposite. opposite. They're going to be equal, but opposite in sign, right? Because one's the system, one's the surrounding. Okay. If something's losing, the other thing has to be picking up. So if, there's here, if the reaction transferred or uh, transferred 50 joules, the surroundings have to pick those up. And so all we have to do is change the sign. Mm, and we'll do it in purple. So the heat of the reaction is equal to the negative heat of the solution. And we've been using this relationship between the system and the surroundings that they're equal in magnitude but opposite in sign for a long time. We've at least been talking about it, and this is where, again, it's going to pay off. That we can monitor the surroundings, the solution, and backtrack it to how much energy was transferred by the system by the reaction. Can we also measure the temperature of water before we put the solution and then after measure it so that yeah, yeah, oh yeah, so that's, yeah, we're absolutely going to need to do that to get delta T. Okay. So first we measure the temperature of the sur uh, surroundings, the solution, then we do the reaction, we add the, the tomorrow for your uh, uh, acid-base neutralization, you put the uh, base in here, measure its initial temperature, then you add the acid and watch the temperature, okay, it goes up, and then that's your final, whenever it stops going up, that's your final, and then you can calculate delta T. <laughs> okay, so that looks like a lot of fun. I bet you're excited to do that in the lab tomorrow. And excited just to do an example today here in lecture. Right. So how about we try a good old example 6.8? Classic. Classic example 6.8. I bet you when you were reading ahead this weekend, you're like, oh, I can't wait till we do example 6.8 in the lecture on Monday. Can't wait for this weekend to be over. So you get back in the class. I know you guys. All right, so let's uh, take a look at what's going on. <laughs> so this is a reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid that uh, reacts according to that balance chemical equation. So the experiment, we want to determine the enthalpy change, which is delta H, enthalpy change delta H. Uh, when 0.158 grams of magnesium metal is combined with enough HCl to make a 100 milliliter solution in a coffee cup calorimeter. The HCl is sufficiently concentrated so that the magnesium completely reacts. All right. Well, before we keep going, there's a, there's, I think Tro's trying to give us something. He's trying to tell us something here. Okay, he says uh, 0.158 grams of magnesium metal is combined with enough HCl. And then HCl is sufficiently concentrated so magnesium completely reacts. What is he trying to tell you about magnesium? What type of reactant would we be able to call magnesium? If there's plenty of HCl to go around. Limiting reactant. Limiting reactant. It's the limiting reactant. Okay, that's why there's all that stuff about, we can, hey, we've got plenty of HCl. You know, it's kind of like the theoretical yield was always calculated on limiting reactants. Your enthalpy change or any stoichiometric value, if it's dependent on the amount of material and the extensive property, it's going to be uh, based on the limiting reactant because if you've got extra HCl not reacting, you're not going to get any energy out of that. It's only the amount that reacts. And so that's why uh, they're telling you here that you've got plenty of HCl. HCl is definitely your reactant or your limiting reactant. And so we could even put that here in the moles. This is moles of your limiting reactant. Okay, but we are still going to follow this <coughs> uh, plan. First, let's calculate the heat of the solution. Okay, so we're going to calculate how much the uh, heat 
or the solution gained or lost that could have transferred to the uh, um, system. Okay, so let's keep reading this problem. So the temperature of the solution rises from 25.6. So initially we measured 25.6. Now it's at 32.8 as a result of the air reaction. Find the delta H for the reaction as written. Use one gram per milliliter as the density and specific heat of solution. That's the same as water. Okay, which is pretty. Uh, if it's if the if the solution is fairly dilute, you can usually use water's physical properties uh, and get away with it. So let's do that. Q of the solution. So what's M stand for again? Mass. What's the mass of the solution? 0.158? 100 grams? So where do you see the 100 grams? We got 100 milliliters of solution, right? So 1.158 grams, what's that of? The magnesium, not the solution. Okay, so what do we know about the solution? We know we have 100 milliliters of it, right? And if we wanted to go to mass, we know the volume. If we wanted to go to mass, volume to mass, what property do we need? To convert from volume to mass. Density. density. Do we have the density? Use 1.00 grams per milliliter as the density. So yeah, so 100 milliliters would be 100 grams. So we do have to look at the solution. And then so we're just going to take this 100.0 milliliters. And then times 1.00 grams per milliliter. And that is going to give us 100 grams and probably with three sig figs, so let's keep that there. And I'll just remember that three sig figs. All right, so we got uh, 100 grams. Specific heat, C, right? Well, they're telling us just to use this 4.18, that's the same as water. So that's 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And then delta T, we're gonna have to calculate delta T, aren't we? So my delta T, always final minus initial, right? What's my final temperature? 32.8? What's my initial? 25.6, thank you. And what do I get? 7.2. So times. So 100 times 4.18 times 7.2. I'm sorry? 8,000. 3,000. And how many joules, joules will be my units, grams cancel out, degrees Celsius cancel out, <coughs> how many significant figures should we have for our answer? Two. 7.2. So what's the only real, what's the only way I'm going to be able to show this with two significant figures? Scientific notation. So 3.0 times 10 to the third joules. Actually, there's another way. What's another way? Another way I could use uh, prefix multipliers. So this is 3,000 joules or 
three kilojoules. I could also go three kilojoules if I wanted to. It didn't really specify, but most of the time, enthalpy is reported to in kilojoules, but you didn't have to convert it in this problem. But that's another way you could have done it. Just say 3.0 kilojoules. All right, so that's my heat of the solution. What was my next step? Well, I know I want to eventually go to enthalpy of the reaction, so I got to flip it, flip the sign to get to my heat of the reaction, right? So two, nope. So my number two is heat of the reaction equals negative heat of the solution. So two, heat of the reaction equals negative heat of the solution, which is going to equal negative 3.0 times 10 to the third joules. Now that's the easiest step for this whole process. But that's probably the one step I see you the most common students just forget to do. The easy stuff is forget. You know, you're worried about doing my calculations, worried about sig fig, all kinds of stuff, and this is the easy one. But we do have to flip it because you're always measuring the surroundings, the solution. You want to backtrack to the system, the reaction. It's always going to be off. So the heat of the reaction is equal to the heat of solution, but just a negative. <coughs> now, our last, but certainly not least, we want to calculate our enthalpy change, delta H, which is equal to the heat of the reaction, which we just calculated. So most of the work's done. We're almost, we're in the clear. Divided by the what? The moles. Moles of what? The magnesium, right? Moles of the limiting reactant. And that's what all this hubbub about. Enough HCl, sufficiently concentrated, so magnesium completely reacts. Definitely trying to tell you that magnesium is a limiting reactant, and that's what you're going to base it off of. That's What's gonna once that's up, that done the reaction's done. Once you're out of magnesium, reaction's done, you're done transferring energy. <coughs> so what do we know about the magnesium? We know the grams. What are we gonna have to do? Convert it to moles using what? Molar mass. Good old molar mass on mole day. Oh, grams to mole calculation on mole day. Oh, today is a good day, people. Alright, so zero point a little bit more room. 0 0.158 grams of magnesium uh, times in one mole of magnesium, 24.31 grams. Grams of magnesium cancel out. Six nine. Six four nine. Six four nine. Six four nine. Three six figs. So six point four nine times ten negative three. Oh, I want three. 2.50. Don't worry, I can erase. <laughs> All right, now let's throw this into our equation. So we got our heat, and we just calculated our mole. So negative 3.0 times 10 to the third joule divided by 6.50 times 10 to the negative third moles.
Negative? 4.6 and that's kilojoules per mole, right? Fifth? Yeah, I could have heard you wrong. They just told me. I was listening. So I got a, do I got a second or third for the fifth? Who likes the fifth? Um, um, the top three, the, the, the top three, the top three, the top three. All right, so that is a pretty standard calorimetry experiment. Okay. Uh, you're monitoring the reaction that's happening in solution. This one happened to be, well, what is it? Is this an exothermic or a endothermic reaction? How do you know? Negative, the delta H is negative. What else? Before we even uh, calculated this, we could have we could have said that it was uh, exothermic. What else told us it was exothermic? The temperature, what happened to the temperature? It went up. That temperature went from 25.6 to 32.8. That tells you it's exothermic. Okay. So, anyways, this is an exothermic reaction happening in solution. You're measuring the solution, which is the surroundings. And so, if you know how much solution, the mass of the solution, which you can always measure the volume, use the density to convert, uh, which we'll do tomorrow. Uh, use the specific heat of the solution. And then that's what you're doing in the lab. You're measuring delta T, calculate delta T. That gives you the heat transferred to the solution. So, of course, if we want to backtrack it to the reaction, you have to flip the sign. That's the relationship between the system and the surroundings. So, getting around that. And then you uh, somehow, some way, you got to figure out how many moles was involved with that reaction because it's an extensive property. If you added more magnesium, you would have got more energy transferred to the solution. The temperature would have went up more. Okay? And so you have to put it on the amount of, uh, put it in terms of the amount of the moles of the linear reaction. And then you've got negative 4.6 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole.